trick and neonatal care at health center level, and the improvement of referral system through UNDP, for example, we started in Dodoma here. Dr. Rutasha is here with us. He spearheaded that. He's, is he around? But he can testify that he's in the meeting. We had our national health policy and HSSPs ex executed, MDGs accomplished, but continued with with, 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 with uh, our vision 2025, we, we implemented SDGs and we started the BRI and star rating. and started piloting in various options of community health workers, including paid CSWs for PHC. Okay. So the res resilience was extended after Astana. So we revisited, reassessed PHC outcomes, the four expected outcomes of PHC. That was a reduction in mortality of vulnerable population groups, reduction of risk factors, development of sustainable health systems. Dr. Antuli can testify to that. Development of policy for action also implemented DHHF, DHF, FF, increased government health financing, universal national health insurance fund, and digital health. Revitalization continued with construction of frontline facilities, supply of equipment, drugs, reagents, transport for referrals, and support of supervision plus intensive recruitment of health workers, including community health workers for PHC. My last slide is the way forward. So, how do we implement Atana, Astana? We have to impress the resilience, take serious and bold consideration on population growth and shift in demographic variables, for example, aging population and shift in disease patterns, expand utilization of digital health and operational research. We have to have a strong leadership, a strong political will that will take universal health coverage as a strategic agenda in Vision 2050, our health policies and HSSP. We have to increase government health budget for self-dependency, sustainable transition from donor dependency syndrome. We have to increase accountability, efficiency, and quality through monitoring and evaluation of support supervision, star rating up to community level, and we have to conduct training in leadership. We need to identify core capacities for intersectorial coordination and cooperation, including the private sector. PHC, PHC, you have to say born in Tanzania, PHC, PHC, Asantendi Sana, thank you very much. Hello. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mte, for detailed uh, presentation regarding the history of uh, primary health. Uh, in Tanzania. Um, I will go straight to and um, introduce uh, the next speaker. Um, the next session will be focusing on exploring untapped potentials of primary health care research agenda in Tanzania. And um, we will have a keynote speaker, Professor Bruno Sunguya, and by introduction, he's a professor of public health and nutrition at the School of Public Health and Social Sciences of the Mohimbiri University. And uh, he's a seasoned researcher um, specializing on public health and nutrition and um, food security, 
adolescent health, maternal and child health research, health systems research and HIV AIDS. Um, he currently serves as the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Research and Consultants at the Mwembiri uh, University. And um, he is a visiting associate professor at Kaimoto University in Japan. Um, the focus of the, this session will be um, to critically uh, examine existing gaps and the challenges in the implementation of uh, research focusing on uh, primary health uh, research uh, within, of course, the broader goal of uh, attaining universal health uh, uh, coverage in Tanzania. So we have experts ranging uh, from uh, the policy body, the Ministry of Health, the implementation body, PRG, we have people from uh, universities, we have uh, a speaker from, I mean a panelist from uh, NIMRI, and um, yeah, one represented from universities. So we thought if, here, I'll just say that we, we are very strict with the time, so you'll have uh, roughly 15 minutes uh, to present, then I will invite the panelists to proceed. But maybe before I forget, I would like to recognize the presence of uh, Dr. Zainab Chaula, former deputy at PS Pioraj, also former PS at the Ministry of Health, and former PS Community Development Ministry, and also former PS at the Ministry of Communi Commun Communication and ICT. Karibu sana and Karibu Prof. Good morning, everyone. Jamuri Mungana wa Tanzania. Thank you very much for attending this session. So um, my keynote will be on uh, exploring the untapped potential for primary health care research agenda. And the presentation really is just to stimulate the discussion. And the, uh, after that, uh, the panelists will, uh, will deep dive into, into more issues uh, around that. Uh, I've been introduced, so I will not uh, waste more time on this. This will be uh, issues that I'll be discussing uh, today. Um, where are we and where are we supposed to be in terms of research agenda? Are we doing justice uh, as far as research is concerned uh, to improve or to inform uh, primary health care and what should be done? This is the age of an adult, 45 years old. Um, we have heard the journey. Uh, it, was be, it was born in Tanzania, but what have we done uh, uh, through this process? Where have we gone wrong? Why are we not supposed to, why are we not uh, where we are supposed to be? Um, did we miss a segment of evidence-informed uh, decisions integrating research in the journey that we've gone through? In all these facets of uh, primary health care, could we have done better? Are we late? Should we start now? And how should we go ahead and implement this? Not only uh, uh, PHC, but a number of uh, other initial research from here. We've been a wonderful classroom for others, but we have not really used uh, all this for ourselves. Yes, we've made progress, but uh, I think uh, it could be done better. And if we uh, utilized all the potentials that we have, all these classrooms that we have, uh, we have uh, managed to, to, to help others, perhaps will be uh, in, other, in, other, um, in another level completely. Without evidence, it's very difficult to, to, to move forward. And uh, I believe that, uh, as you all know, 
that uh, there are areas that definitely needs uh, to be to be informed by research, by evidence, and through evidence we can move uh, with uh, with a, a more steady speed and a more consistent one. There are needs, and these needs are quite many. I will tap into a few that uh, at least will make you realize the essence of integrating research into PHC so that our moves, our decisions can be more, inf uh, more informed. For, for, for better research, uh, to, to, in order to conduct good research at primary health care, just like any other places, you need problems. Now let's move together. Do we have problems at PHC that needs research? Do we? Yes or no? Do they need evidence to address them? Yes or no? Unfortunately, I'm a, I'm a lecturer, so uh, questioning and answers is the way I live. But uh, are these problems that we, that we see or we live with at primary health care researchable ones? Are we pro-evidence or blockers in using these evidences ourselves? Sometimes we tend to oppose or to be in the, in the other side of evidence and make decisions perhaps based on our experiences or something like that. But can our evidence that we have currently support the decisions? These are the areas that we need to address or to at least know in order to establish good problems that can be researchable. But we need to also know the research gaps. You cannot do anything in research if you, if you have not established the research gaps. My teacher and professor Simba will uh, testify to that. Now, do we know the research problems at PHC? Do we know these research gaps? And how do we get around them? How do we tend to know? Do we have the capacity to identify these research gaps? Because without identifying them, without ability to identify them, we cannot really address anything. Now, do we also believe in the potential of research to address these gaps? Or it's just the mere uh, experiences that we have been living by? At PHC, can we have the tools as simple as possible to collect some of the information that can actually help us to address these gaps? At the end of the day, are we part of that? Do we believe in this kind of a pathway? Another important area to look at are the research environment. Sometimes, my colleagues, when I ask them, when, when we talk about research, they only view research in terms of money. There is no fund for research. We don't have money to do research. And if someone comes to your facility trying to do research, you think that person is a donor and has a bag of money for research. So we have been equating, we've been uh, making uh, research as, uh, as, as sort of an income generation, or sometimes we think research is equal to money. So that's another narrative that needs to be corrected. Research environment here needs to be uh, in terms of people. We need people for research. We need people who are capable to address related issues, issues related to research. But another important area that I need to tell you today is the, um, what's this? Yeah, another important, another important area is uh, research agenda. In order to be informed, in order to be focused, or to remain focused uh, for research in, P in PHC, we need to have a dedicated P, uh, PHC research agenda. This will help us, in all, uh, will, uh, will, uh, will help us to, to be aligned in one path uh, in order to be at least uh, do meaningful research and something like that. Policies, the country is full of policies, very good policies for research. But can we use these policies and integrate them and guidelines and integrate them in PHC? I've talked about competencies. We need to have our people competent enough to be able to identify the research gaps, the problems, and to at least get the meaningful or the, the meaning of the data that they collect every day. Funds, I've put it last because to me, 
it's not everything. If you, if you believe in research, fun comes after that. I always tell my colleagues that uh, always money, fun, money finds ideas or money follows the ideas. If you have good ideas, money will definitely follow it. Of course, it is important ingredient doing research or disseminate one. Now, I'll use the next few minutes that I have to talk briefly about the untapped potentials. And in, the te in terms of untapped potential, here I mean issues or areas that they are just out there, that if we refocus our thinking, we can actually move forward the agenda of PHC as far as research is concerned. The first one is data. We have gold mine of data, gold mines in every aspect. Gotomis, DHIS2, and all the data sets that collect patients' information, patients' travel information every day. These are vastly available to all of us. And the problem is we have not tapped, I think, even 0.1% of it. These are a lot of data. And anyone from outside the country, if they have an access to just see what we have, they always go crazy for what we have. Another important area is the uh, programmatic data. We collect data every day in our programs. We collect a ton of data in malaria, in HIV, the CTC2 uh, data sets, and something like that, in maternal and child health in immunization platforms, in NCDs, it's not yet established, but there is a lot of data that comes out in that area, NTDs and others. These are a lot of data that we don't even have to go back again to the field to collect them. We can make use of them, but the important thing is the other ingredient, the capacity, the, 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 the ability, and the you know, other untapped potential is the uh, PHC as an important research site. All these facilities, all these people, our people who goes to the facilities, the reach of, of these facilities to the community, these are the right platform to do all this kind of research. If they are well coordinated, the ongoing health programs with data, these are massive areas that we can actually tap on. Research projects and implementation research that can actually be conducted in PHC. Perspective studies and cohorts, follow up of these people that are visiting the facilities every day. But students that we train in the universities or health, uh, other, other training institutions, nationals or internationals, but also the independent and institutions that they really need all this data and platform to conduct the research. These are untapped potentials that needs to be, um, to be taken care of. But also, another untapped potential are research fund. Yes, I said right. Research fund is another untapped potential. We have money, ladies and gentlemen, and my colleagues. But the problem is we don't know where that money is, or sometimes we think we cannot reach it. At sub-national level, we have a very nice policy now that every council, region, and I think other, other that there is a certain percentage of funds, I think three to five percent of the budget should be dedicated to, the, to, the, to, to, to research. This, this is a lot of money if you collect them uh, uh, all together. This is a lot of money if it is put into the right use. This is a lot of money if it can be put to improve the capacity of our people at PHC. We can start with this amount of money. We can start it either at seed money or the money to improve the capacity or to build enthusiasm for research and something like that. But we have our colleagues. We have uh, partners in development. We have development partners. We have implementing partners. These are the people who are ready to help us. But sometimes because we don't have such kind of uh, uh, research agenda or things that we want from ourselves, we let them drive the agenda themselves. They may not know what we need better than we do. So um, these are areas and these are the sources of funds for research that we do. There is one item that I've, I've been very successful in my own university, tapping the potential of young people. And this has been the use of seed fund or seed money giving these young people who are enthusiastic in research small amount of money can actually help to drive the agenda with speed, precision, and helping us to address the issue. 
Yeah. So, so uh, this is another area that a small amount of that money that is being actually uh, uh, earmarked for research in the council, small bit about of it can actually be allocated to these young people who are enthusiast enough to do the research themselves. Another important area is the, uh, the institutions or the universities that we have. The universities and training institutions are plenty in the Tanzania, but I don't believe that we have utilized all of them significantly. If we use these universities, sometimes because, if you, because we are not using, they forget that their core function, one of them is research, and they stick to training only. So um, we can task them. If we have a proper research agenda, we can task them and put them to task in terms of research at PHC. They have potentials in terms of resources that are underutilized. One important ingredient are students. In our universities, guided by TCU, every student that walks out of the gates of any university has to have a thesis. That thesis has to have either primary or secondary data collected. Times the number of students that we have and the research gaps that we have, definitely we do not have to complain about human resource for research in this country. But research is uncoordinated, so everyone does what they feel like. We are not guided as such. In some, research is not even the main research agenda or the main agenda in the universities. Feedback to the PHC where we collect data is something that we don't do because we are not tasked to do. Morally, yes, but no one is following us on giving back the evidences that we've collected from these people. At the end of the day, we just collect and not returning back. But also, the dissemination may not be done uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the manner that can actually be coordinated. But what about research institutions? We have very strong research institutions, NIMRI as the main coordinator of research, but also we have AAPH, Ifakara Health Institute, AESRIF, all these are wonderful institutions, but can we align all these into the PHC to address the research agenda? Because if we don't, even the ownership of what they do will just be theirs and not, and not belong to us. Um, Another important thing, which is almost the last one that I'm talking about, yeah. Yeah, I'll just finish. Yes, yeah, I'll just finish. So, so another important, which is my one of the, my take home, is the research agenda for PHC. We have the national research agenda. Yes, but one thing that we are missing is the tailored research agenda for PHC. We have another research agenda for, for non-communicable diseases. Other areas like HIV, malaria, they have research issues that they are, they are dealing with annually. But for PHC, we don't have one. I know it's very broad, but this is something that we really need to address. Now, PHC has been left behind, but should it be our deliberation in this meeting or in this forum? Should it be, uh, how should it be coordinated, and how should we align ourselves uh, around this? I have only few issues that I wanted to, to as, as take home. Uh, one important issue is, uh, of course, building the research agenda for PHC, starting now and move there and, and move on and keep on monitoring on what we do, but also building enthusiasm for research, building an enabling environment for research. We can do that at whatever level that we can. But we have to own it and be ready to share with others so that all this vast data can actually finally be utilized. But also support through funding, whether it's seed funding, council or facility budgets, partnerships and collaboration, implementation science, and, uh, and, and the rest. But importantly also to collaborate. We all have to do this, publish, use evidence and, you, and, and, and be ready to receive the evidence as the, uh, for, for our own decision making. Fortunately, my slides are messed up, but what I meant to do here is uh, we need to dream big. If your dreams do not scare you, they are not big enough. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Professor Bruno, for your 
well articulated and uh, comprehensive um, presentation. Um, because of we are running short of time, I will uh, directly invite uh, the the panelists. Yeah. So to start with, uh, we will have Dr. Omari Ubuguyu. He's an assistant uh, director at the Ministry of Health, and he has over 15 years of experience, particularly in NCD, mental health and uh, injuries. He's uh, currently registered as a PhD candidate at the Muhimbiri uh, University. And uh, he has broad ex and extensive experience in program design, teaching, research in the health field uh, with over 30 uh, publications. Uh, our next, yeah, let's clap for Our next panelist will be uh, Dr. Salma Mahmoud. She's the Dean, the School of Health and Medical Sciences at the Uni State University of Zanzibar. She specializes in obstetric and gynecology. She has actively participated in prestigious committees such as EXA, COG, AGOTA, Zahili, and has extensively uh, published in issues uh, covering lymphatic tumor metastasis. Uh, and uh, she graduated uh, from her PhD from the Medical Center, KCMC. And uh, she is extensively uh, experienced in terms of clinical research cl as a clinician, teaching, and she holds a PhD from the University of Bergen. And uh, currently, she is the director of the Kilimanjaro Clinical Research Institute, KCRI. And I think she's here representing KCRI uh, as a research institute. So. Next is Dr. Kengia. Tumaini Kengia, he is a, a specialist, a seasoned uh, public health specialist in health economics and uh, currently serves as the coordinator for research and publication at the president, uh, I mean P.O. Raj. His background, background spans from uh, serving as a hospital administrator and he holds notable qualifications including a PhD in public health leadership from Tokyo Medical and Dental University in Japan. He has an MBA for medical doctors from University of Applied Sciences, New Arm, German. Dr. Kengia expertise extends from teaching at the University of Dodoma, where he serves as an adjunct lecturer. And also, uh, yeah, he's a researcher and extensively published in uh, the area of health system uh, management. So welcome, uh, Dr. Kengia. Uh, next on the list is uh, Dr. Janda Elias Tinginya. Dr. Janda Elias Tinginya is a principal research uh, scientist with a background as a, the, he's a medical doctor from the University of Dar es Salaam and holds a master's degree in tropical and infectious disease from the University of Lima. He has more than 15 years in research experience conducting research ranging from uh, in areas like TB, HIV, emerging diseases, NCD, health systems. I mean, a very broad and extensive uh, CV. And um, yeah, he has also, uh, yeah, he, he started as a, also a clinician and he has worked at Nimuli for an extensive uh, period of, of, of time, as explained. Yeah, so. Thank you. So this is uh, the lineup of the panelists, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, that uh, we have included people from the policy body, we have people from uh, the research institutes, and we have panelists coming from uh, PRH with the implementer. And so we will run our discussion by first uh, covering some questions to each of the members of the panel uh, regarding their specific role from the institution that they represent. 
regarding uh, exploring and uh, the untapped potentials for risk, I mean, healthy on primary health uh, re uh, research. Yeah. So we will give those questions and then uh, each panel, a member of the panel will respond uh, maybe in uh, two to uh, four uh, minutes because we have uh, at least uh, uh, 20 minutes to complete this and then uh, later on we'll have the question and answer uh, session which will cover up to 30 uh, minutes. So my first question. We'll go to the to Dr. Omar Obuguyu, who represents the Minister of Health, in this case, the police uh, body. And um, so the question is that uh, having a research agenda for primary health, uh, as has already been mentioned by the keynote speaker, is very useful in determining the research priorities, resource um, allocations, and aligning uh, the implementing and research partners. So we know that you have experience uh, of developing a research agenda to the Minister of Health for NCD. So based on this experience, uh, how can this be done when we look at the uh, primary health care uh, research agenda, development of the research agenda? And the second, how can we strengthen research at the primary health uh, care? What are the hidden potential that the Ministry of Health can support while you're working together with the uh, PRH? Dr. Bugui. Okay, thank you very much. Good morning. Uh, I think Professor Bruno said it all. He had a very uh, wide presentation which makes a little bit difficult for us to add anything because they've covered almost all the spectrum. However, when I uh, was hearing, talking about uh, research agenda for PHC, I, a little bit, a little bit uh, from what you're thinking because there's nothing uh, dedicated for PHC uh, because what we want a research agenda to be a national wide and the PHC is just a platform where those national research agenda we had when we have uh, NCD research agenda we missed representation of people from PHC we had a very good NCD research agenda there's a, a pool of experts from all fields uh, we had people from PORH thinking that they are representing PHC which actually it is not, because POR are central, like us. So we missed people from the dispensary, we missed people from the health centers, and DMOs and the colleagues who uh, could have had value when we presented the, the NCD research agenda. So one thing which I wish we could have done differently is just having technical working group, having people from dispensary, people from health centers being part uh, of the NCD research agenda and probably all other uh, research agendas in the countries. I once worked with the drug users community and they always say that nothing for us without us. So, PRH, you are not representing PHC, but PHC needs to be there, dispensaries need to be there, so we could have added the, uh, dispensaries in the health centers. The second uh, issues I've seen with other countries they don't have uh, research agendas specifically for PHC, but they have PHC uh, research evaluation and development strategy. So instead of having a research agenda at that level, we need to have a develop research development strategy at PHC, whereby we will uh, design, co-design, uh, and implement different uh, issues. You presented a number of uh, key components for the research uh, agenda to be implemented at the PHC. So we could incorporate almost all uh, 10 areas that we have presented into the PHC research evaluation and development strategy, whereby it can be utilized and we can set target uh, for five, 10 years and make follow-up and see if we can have enough resources 
uh, to make PHC research agenda moves. So, but when are we going to implement it? I can't promise here, but let us take it as a, a challenge to us from Minister of Health, P.O. Raj, and our colleague from the President's office, I mean from Prime Minister's office, because with the NCD and most of the health care issues, with social determinant of health, many ministries are involved. So we can take it as a team, and probably next year we will come up with a, a strategy. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Obuguyu. I think the way you put it, uh, it's good that it's a starting point. We need a research agenda or even something to mimic a research agenda that will guide all other uh, implementers, our efforts, our resources towards uh, uh, many strengthening research on primary health care in our country, including uh, tapping on the potential that uh, Professor Bruno has already said. Um, now I'll move to... Um, Dr. Salma Mahmoud, who represents the Higher Learning Institution. And on your part, I think automatically uh, the question falls on capacity development and the role of Higher Learning Institution in uh, um, strengthening uh, research in primary health uh, care. So we, all, we, we already know that there is a disjoint between the implementers and the training institution in addressing uh, gaps in primary health uh, research. So you as a person who is representing a learning institution, how should the training institutions take part in building the capacity of human resource for research? And secondly, how can we increase the research enthusiasm? As he, uh, Professor Bruno has mentioned, we need the capacity, ability, and enthusiasm from at all levels. So in this case, how can we increase the research enthusiasm for primary health care research while making use of evidence uh, using the massive data that is available? You already mentioned about the plenty of data sources at the facilities, at the different institutions. So, yeah, if you can respond. Please. Thank you very much, moderator, for those insightful questions. Starting with the question number one, I would like to raise the awareness that the current, our training institution, especially the higher learning in health and allied sciences, have great contribution in training human resources and research capacity. Taking example of MUHAS and other training institution in Tanzania mainland and SUSA in Zanzibar, we are all witness to great role of those institutions have been playing in production of manpower of health profession to support and to sustain not only the health sciences needed to operate the PHC, but also in health research as well. However, I agree that there is a need for, room for to improve and expanding their participation in building capacity for PHC research. As we all know that PSC research is a bit different from the basic science research and should look at the programmatic problem, programmatic problem and develop effective strategy, especially in implementation of the effective intervention at the primary health care levels. I oversee several key strategies areas that I consider still as a virgin land. Health and the large sciences training institution in general can further increase their engagement in building the capacity for the research. They can develop curriculum for specially focus on the PHC research. Curriculum for the research method are focusing on the mainstream scientific research, which mainly focus on the basic science. A gap still exists to build capacity for the PhD research, which mainly incorporate implementation research. Therefore, review of curriculum incorporate implementation research methodology, ethics, data analysis, mm. and improve, will improve PhD research capacity. The second one is the institution need to improve the effective partnership with healthcare facilities. Here, what I mean is that primary healthcare 
staff should not only merely used as a data collectors. Effective partnership with holistic, clinic, and the community health organization to facilitate field research and data collection is built upon continuous research mentorship and feedback so that they can, as well as address their own issue through research when need arise. Another area to consider is by having formalized research uh, mentorship program. Here we need to create a formal mentorship program where seasoned researchers, mentors, students, and junior faculties, guiding them through the research process and career development. Another one, institute can have improved research grants and funding securing capacity. In this area, we need to assist students and faculty in securing grants and fund in, for PhD research. As for the second question, uh, I will say that the increase in enthusiasm for PhD research while leveraging This approach can provide a more comprehensive understanding on how to use data to improve PHC. We can also, we can also use the meth method of showcasing impactful research. Mm -hmm. Here to highlight successful research, uh, successful PHC research projects that have been utilized big data to make significant health improvement. This not only motivates current researchers but also attract prospective students and faculty interested in conducted, conducting meaningful research. Gaining access to data and analytic tools. Institution need to provide access to large health data set and analytic tool. tool. So collaboration with health care organization, government agencies, and private sector. So the researcher can oppose can opportunity to work with its intensive healthcare database. Another sensitive area, which also uh, Professor Bruno mentioned, is the research grant and incentives. Institutions need to offer a grant and incentives for research project focused on PHC research. Funding can serve as a significant motivator of researchers to pursue projects in this area, especially workshop and training session, especially in big data, analytics, research methodology, and evidence-based practice in PHC. So I hope that implementation, these strategies, training institutions can significantly enhance enthusiasm for PHC research and encourage the effective use of massive data set to inform and improve healthcare practice and policy. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Salma. Fatma. Yeah. Um, how we are playing the role, uh, because it's a mandatory and a part of our core business to make sure that research is uh, conducted and everybody is involved, and uh, it's a requirement nowadays, for example, for master's student, they must at least uh, develop a manuscript. So it's just a matter of us setting the priorities right and uh, making sure that uh, the supervision is setting the agenda of uh, primary health uh, care within our small, small uh, agendas within our institutions. But again, I would, I'm very excited to hear uh, the member of the panel from uh, Nimri, uh, what he will say. Uh, we all understand that Nimri is uh, the custodian of medical research uh, in our country, and uh, it's the one that provides uh, stewardship 
for implementing the national uh, research agenda. So somehow, of course, uh, primary health care has not been well featured. That is the feeling that we, we have. And uh, uh, now I have a question to you. Um, how can NIMRI assist in building, firstly, the research capacity? Uh, there is a lot of untapped potentials, including the data that we produce. The systems are there uh, at the facility level in our institutions. But the issue is um, the use, utilization of the data, the coordination of those who want to use the data. I think this falls within the mandate of NIMRI. So how are you going to ensure that uh, there is uh, coordinated accessibility use of the data that we are producing in the facilities that are different levels and having that everybody is well coordinated so that we have a PHS, PHC research implementation uh, yeah, improvement across all levels in our country. Uh, a very good morning. Uh, dear moderator and colleagues, it's, it's a profound and honor to be here on behalf of the our very own National Institute for Medical Research, and thanks, Professor Bruno, for such an illuminating uh, keynote. Just to, to, to highlight, uh, uh, Mr. Moderator, uh, back in the days in 1979, uh, when our, our first president, uh, Baba Taifa Marim Julius Nyerere, ascended the NIMRI Act uh, into operation after the Parliamentary Act Number 23 uh, that came into operation. All the research value chain right from the primary health care, with one of the mandates being to, to promote the carrying out of research, uh, of medical research, uh, to alleviate uh, diseases of, for the people of Tanzania. That means uh, PHC was factored into the equation. And one of the, also the mandate and functions uh, goes on to see how that uh, NIMRI coordinates, I think, the uh, cooperating with or collaborating with the government or so any person uh, to utilize the facilities for training uh, local personnel so that they can be able to generate scientific evidence. But uh, on the other hand, they are one of them are within. So it's true, NIMRI uh, is, uh, has, is mandated to do that. And uh, if I can highlight uh, uh, our keynote speaker, then echoed by uh, Dr. Bruno Amini, uh, Dr. Omari, and Dr. Salma. I want also to acknowledge uh, Dr. Mtei, who gave the, the initial uh, uh, journey that he highlighted. And I'm really excited also how you, you mentioned I studied at Kibaha, uh, so it was exciting when you echoed on that. So that was very, very impressive. And actually, PHC is a, is, is, is a foundation for human health. You go north, you go east, even now in the west, they are going back to, you know, uh, to, the, to the primary health care, including discussing with some colleagues in, in other European countries, etc. So thank you so much, Dr. Mtei, for such a wonderful... For some of us, we may forget, but you know, when you come in in that capacity, and for us at NIMRI, it's exciting because that it gives a foundation, and everyone, and I want to acknowledge uh, the, I mean, the pure Raj for setting up this, because to me, this is where we have to converge and everyone should be built on that, including our research agenda. And uh, just to, to come back now to the questions, uh, in a summary, how can NIMRI uh, take stock on building capacity uh, uh, for uh, research? Apparently, NIMRI has been working with various uh, uh, RHMTs, regions, hospitals, CHMTs, uh, in building capacity. We are uh, doing, uh, not extensively, we are, we are working out with some hospitals, uh, I can echo even a few months ago, uh, the Mbeya Nimri Center was training uh, researchers at Rukwa Regional Hospital, yeah. uh, Songwe, etc., but also in Arusha, Amana, etc. But also we are working with the professional bodies. So we, what we take from here is to galvanize and coordinate, but also taking stock that, you know, as a coordinator of research within the country, is to identify our key stakeholders, as Professor Bruno has said, there are so many people in the value chain of research. We need to take stock and also bring them on board. Why the research institution, Dr. Salma was mentioning, uh, we come in as NIMRI to provide capacity by, by, by doing. 
uh, I mean, working right within the facilities that we have been doing. And, and you know, taking also advantage of the research coordinators at the regional hospital, but also at the RHMT, that is what we actually we can build on ongoing research, but also using the capacity that is in-house with our scientists. Number two, the use of data is imperative. Uh, Dr. Bruno Professor has mentioned about uncoordinated research and data. We have been also working with, with the programs, and, but also hospitals. And NIMRI has been involved uh, even improving the quality of data that has been collected uh, at various facilities. So what actually we are now moving forward, and I think I'm looking forward to provide this, and I'm sure that Dr. Kengia will uh, make sure that we are coming up with this, is to making sure that uh, all players within the research value chain we see how we can continue working together to make use of this data that can inform policy right from the, uh, the feedback uh, Professor Bruno has mentioned uh, so that not only we publish but also the person at the community level, uh, not only even in facility, community level, identify, uh, understand the data that was collected and analyzed. So NIMRI has such capacity in data analysis but also there are other research institutions and players in the equation that we are looking forward to bring them together so that we can, uh, we, we can inform the, the country uh, not in isolation. Because when we come together, we'll definitely add value to this great nation through data use and analysis. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now because of time, I will have to rush and urge the panelists, please be uh, as brief as possible, but don't lose the meaning or quality of whatever that you want to, to, to give us. We have some, yeah, very limited time left. And um, my question now goes to Professor Blandina Mbaga from KCRI. And um, this is uh, a research institution that it runs at 100%, uh, I mean, being supported by research grants. So I think you being, you being here, we want to learn from, from you. And as we set the agenda for uh, primary health uh, research, what lessons uh, have you learned in the process and uh, what are the best lessons that can we take uh, in the process? Particularly, um, how can we tap uh, the financial resources for primary health uh, care research and ensure uh, sustainability as we have managed in your institution? Uh, secondly, how can we maintain national focus? We need it to have an agenda, but maybe we don't have the financial resources comes from here and there. So how can we uh, maintain a national focus with the sourcing of funds from different uh, sources that may come with different priorities and uh, deadlines? And uh, lastly, what could be the challenges and how can we mitigate them in line uh, with the funding resources? Yes, Professor. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, for the introduction. Actually, talking up after uh, my two fellows from the university as well as research institution, and I'm also from the university and the research institution, it's quite very important that uh, our success and the lesson uh, learned from our part is only because we are working very close with primary health care facilities. Because without primary health care facilities, working with us, we don't have research sites, we don't have research participants. So our role is also to support and build the capacity into the uh, primary healthcare facilities to create conducive environments for research activities and support the primary healthcare facilities to be able to uh, enroll participants and do the research. So what we are doing normally, we are involving them when we come up with new research ideas. And if we are planning to go and recruit from uh, different primary healthcare facilities, we are working together, brainstorming, 
and expanding our ideas based on what is needed in the health facilities and see in terms of infrastructure and capacity what is needed to be built there so that we can be able to uh, conduct research. So we have started in some of the areas where it is not easy to go and start recruiting because the, the environment is not conducive. So we will uh, work and build up infrastructure, either renovation of the areas, but also training of the staff at the health facilities and involving them at least into the simple research methodology so that they can be part and parcel of doing the research activities. And the most important thing we also do, whenever we do any research, we make sure that we involve them to understand the outcome of the research, what has been, what we have been done. And even if the research is not done by only Tanzania, it's an international research, normally it ends, it produces the results, they uh, published in national and maybe international uh, peer-reviewed journal, but our people want to know about that. Yeah, so we go back, we call, like in Kilimanjaro we have more than 20 health facilities which we are working uh, with them together. We normally call them once or twice a year and give feedback of the project we have done or the project which are coming and there we get their opinion, including what we call community advisor board, which we are using before for clinical trials, but now we have expanding to use for all research activities because they are critically and they are advising us and what to do. Yeah, so that has been a part of uh, the activities we've been done and uh, creating a, and building capacity, infrastructure, but also supporting equipment like some of the health facilities we are not able uh, to do a blood culture. So through the research, we make sure that we have at least one health facility who, uh, which are able to do it. So we have kind of putting all the infrastructure for blood culture. And uh, so, but we need the cooperation with the local government to support the ongoing reagents uh, purchase so that the infrastructure does not stay as how it is. So the most important also in research in a primary health care, as uh, Professor uh, Dr. Nyanda has said, there is huge data which are there and no one is utilizing them. So our task, and especially after this meeting, is make sure that we train people in uh, health facilities to analyze and make use of the data because this helps them in improving performance, creating evidence, but also assessing themselves going forward. And the most important people is to, uh, has to understand that evaluating their data is not judging them, but is to support them improving their capacity and utilizing and monitoring the change which they are making. So to maintain the national focus while uh, doing the research, as I said, is involving the local government, making sure that we're moving with the national research agenda. Luckily, we have been part and parcel in uh, uh, creating the national research agenda. As we say that we need now to trickle down and kind of uh, making sure we expand some of those agenda to cover things in the primary health care so that people in primary health care can, can also utilize that. Because the way it is now, it's like on a higher level and uh, we need to trickle down and make sure that the health facilities are also accessing and make the use of it to, uh, to work on it. To maximize networking and collaboration with the primary health care facilities. As of currently, we are trying to build even the hard skills like genomic sequencing, implementing in sequencing using nanopore because we are expanding now from KCRI with our uh, big tools to the lower level. Holders engagement is quite very important. Yeah, uh, without the stakeholders, there is no research. There is no one will uptake your research if we are not involving policymakers 
as well as local leaders in creating the research uh, which we want to do as well as during uh, also maintain what we want is negotiation skills. Some research are coming with quite different uh, help us to reshape the uh, research uh, ideas to tailor to our own national need and the local need and that is uh, what makes it and support. But other issue is capacity building. Sometimes in this research, they never say about it, training MSc or PhD. They will talk about you workshop and workshop and workshop, mm. which you find that there is a lot of workshop. Then after the project, everyone is like going apart. So it's quite very important to uh, negotiate and uh, talk about long-term skills like MSc and PhD so that we can be able to retain people who can also facilitate and work, whether it's implementation of science and other things. So what could be the challenge? I think uh, one of the challenges, as I said, some of the resource uh, need really uh, power for a kind of mobilization. So we need a resource mobilization within uh, the PRLI so that uh, they can be part and parcel of kind of looking at the uh, agenda which fits to our own country and make sure they are working and put time, especially in proposal write-up, which normally we see it two months ago, but for our culture, people are waiting two weeks before the deadline is when they start gathering the team and the write-up. It will never wake up because you don't, you don't have enough time to gather the inform information. Creating enabling environment, but sometimes I see the challenge is fear of negotiation. Yeah? So whenever people are seeing the opportunity, they just want to grab it and without thinking and, uh, and actually negotiate on it. So most of the time you have to know that they need us, we need them, we need to sit down, negotiate and understand what we need in our country and what is uh, uh, expectation. Uh, Professor Bruno talked about monetary, yeah? We need also people to understand even in primary health care that research can come not sometimes with monetary gain, but with training, infrastructure, equipment, which can be more and sustainable to use for future, including one of the last challenge is data ownership, yeah, okay. in projects. So we are working, we are creating data. Sometimes if we don't create our own, the way of owning, owning our own data, yeah. sometimes it's not even easy to access our own data, which we have collected. Yeah. That is so, really a challenge. Yeah. So for us, cases, so that we can be able to retain the data beyond the project and utilize it within yeah. the country thank and you. beyond that. So thank, thank you. you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Prof. It is very tempting to have I think you have set an example as an institution, and for us who are coming from other institutions, maybe we'll need some more time to just engage with you and discuss more about this. Now, I'm wondering what is going on in the head of Dr. Kengia after all this, I mean, this conversation regarding PHC, because you represent Atamisemi Piorad, which is the custodian of PHC. Um, and in this case, PH, PHC research is part of your, uh, I mean, responsibility. Uh, so what will be your immediate and long-term, uh, should say, actions from here going forward? And um, what, what are the foreseen challenges in uh, addressing the critical uh, gaps that you have had today? and uh, what should be done in mitigating them. So I think you, you can answer briefly. I expect a lot of questions directed to you, so we'll ex ex extend the discussion during the Q&A. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chairman. Uh, indeed, for me, I'm touched with what a uh, colleague here have said, because all things, those things that have been echoed I vividly seen to one of our publication, recent publications that we published with regard to research capacity in Tanzania public assistance of trainings. Training for our subnational staff is key, but here uh, in our paper we also saw that one of the important facilitators uh, in terms of research capacity is partnership. 
So we need also to invest to our colleague here, KCRI uh, train institutions, NIMRI, so that we can partnership in the capacity building, not only a formal training of face-to-face, -face, but rather the mentorship aspect. That is also one of the very important that need to be engaged in our, uh, our setup. The second important thing that was also echoed here and in our publications was the weak research infrastructures. Here are talking about how can our people in our facilities have a research-friendly environment. The infrastructure talking about ability to access some of the uh, journal articles electronically. Uh, there is a way of accessing. But not only that, but other infrastructure related to technologies. Somebody needs to stay in an office and easily have an access to some of the uh, uh, laptop, whether it's computers, uh, printing materials and the likes. But uh, the other important thing is the network, uh, the, 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 the internet itself. That is another very important area that we have seen also in our publication. The other thing that you need also to clear in, 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 in our house, of course, the issue of time was seen also as a barrier to conducting research at PhD. That can be addressed really by really working together. At PRAG, we, we have done this within the last two years. We usually conduct what we call the research camp with our research counterparts and, uh, and, and the training institutions. Through research camp, we are able to publish a number of publications, a lot, a lot. So we need to create kind of uh, a community of practices uh, throughout the countries. We have a very strong network of training institutions and research institutions countries, so that they can support each other, working together, and come up with some research works together. Through that uh, approach, we are able to tap funding issues, but also capacity issues, and of course, the, the skills and experience will be imparted through that uh, uh, angles. So talking about now uh, some long-term goals, I'm seeing uh, really we need to work together, strengthen the partnership that is core, I already said that, but we need to create a repository. We need to access some, some, some manuscripts, some, some papers in the PHC, we need to create a, a repository. Like, but the uh, other thing is uh, opportunity for publications. That is also kind of a barrier, especially we are now in the middle-income countries. Maybe you need to pay some fees. So we need to find a way where we can find some uh, local journals that people can able now to publish. Not only publish in the papers, but sharing like a conference like this one, so that all those information can be taped and uh, through the knowledge management aspect, we are able now to translate in, in the use aspects. And uh, for Tanzania, we have already initiated kind of collaborative work uh, that is championed by the WHO. It's called the EVIPNET, Evidence Informed Policy Network, where researchers and, and policy makers, we can sit together now and tape all those resources that are coming, and we can utilize that, them now for uh, being utilized. Because I cannot just publish a paper that is not going to arrive into the end point into utilization into the policy levels. So that is another very, very important area. Having said that, maybe I end here and wait for further discussion. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you very much, Dr. Kangia. Uh, another round of applause to the, so we won't be able to have the question and answer session. Yeah, that is, yeah, that is the situation. Speak and uh, uh, members of the panel. I think this was a very fruitful discussion and um, Thanks to the audience too for your cooperation and listening. I believe this is going to, 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 we are going to have these kind of discussions in the future. Thank you. Kuna naomba nitambue uwepo wa Deputy Permanent Secretary kutoka Pure Rouge na nitampa ye na fasi onge wakati tunapige picha. Naomba tunyoshe mstari mzuri. Can we have the ladies in the middle? It's a protocol. Karibu DPS. Thank you very much. I would like to take this opportunity actually to thank the presenters and in particular Professor Bruno. The presentation was quite good. So most people here have been talking about research in PHC, but then someone also said it's a research and it is for PhD, PHC, and as well as a higher level. So for me as a deputy permanent secretary, PO Large, on behalf of the PO Large management. I must say that uh, this, uh, this morning session was very, very interesting. So at PO Large, you have got a strategic implementation plan. And one of the uh, strategic objective is to uh, make sure that research, innovation, and uh, evidence synthesis strengthened by 
June 2028. And that was one area, because we have got eight strategic objectives, but that is one area where I think we have not been doing well. But you being here, if we are going to lead a partner with you, I'm sure we will add value to the implementation of the strategic objectives. And the target is collaboration with the universities and the research institutions, and also help us to do dissemination and evidence-based. So I must say that the doors are open. Now the doors are open. If we are seriously want to solve the problems or to improve the health provision and the social welfare as well as nutrition in the country, we have to do serious investment in the PHC and a serious collaboration. So we have to, the doors are open. There has been existing discontinuity, but I must say that namely uh, MUHAS and the other middle cadre uh, 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 health in, uh, institutions, you are most welcome. All your students, let them participate, come in for internship to the PHC facilities, or areas where you can even find health facilities that are well equipped. So I think together we can raise enthusiasm of research at the PHC, but help us to build the capacity of health workforce at PHC. You can also together help us to disseminate the outcomes. You remember recently there was an outbreak of, outbreak of Marburg, but it was put down in a very short time. And I remember when the Minister for Health provided a clear policy to make sure that we collaborate from the higher level to the lower level to solve this problem. Thank you. Thank you very much. A round of applause to our DPS, Pioral Giasante. Um, the follow-up session. Naomba kutambua na kueshimu wepo waziri wa afya msafu kutoka Zanzi Barashid Saif. Naomba usimame tukupigie makofi. Naomba usimame. Sorry? Ame? Samani, nime, nime saisho, waziri mstafu wa afya Tanzania bara. Nombo usmame tukupigie makofi. Dashikuru sana, sante. Tumekuwa nae na bado tutendelea kuwa nae. Let's take the discussions uh, with the uh, panelists on the uh, going sessions. Now, we're going into parallel session. Asante mzemtei. We're going into parallel session. At the main hall, we'll have the World Health Organization discussing overcoming performing, uh, performance challenges in PHC. Number to skilizane kwa makini, so that when I allow everyone to leave, we shall only reconvene here after lunch. So WHO will be discussing overcoming performance challenges here in the main hall. Kawawa Hall, uh, under GIZ, Leadership and Governance for Primary Health Care. Zanzibar Hall, towards ensuring access to SRH services among young people and people with disability. This is done by Engender Health. Rubondo Hall will be discussing reproductive, maternal, and child health. Secretariat Hall will be discussing social welfare and social and behavior change communication. After break, after tea break, uh, main hall, we shall have M. Mama looking on to from the vision to reality, ensuring early, timely, and safety emergency transportation for mothers and babies. Kawawa Best Practices Forum, Kawawa Hall, then Zanzibar Hall, Nutrition in Primary Health Care in Tanzania, Rubondo Nutrition Services and Neglected Tropical Diseases, Secretariat, NCDs. This is after break. We shall have lunch, and after lunch, we shall all reconvene in here where we shall have special issues. We shall have customer care workshop, but also yesterday we missed a very important session by HRH, Human Resources for Health. It will also be done in here. So after lunch, we shall all reconvene here. Final announcement, we have the booth by TAN CDA. They do free uh, medical checkup for NCDs. And after that, you get to get yourself a free copy of this wonderful book titled Mtindo wa Maisha na Magonjo wa Siu Ambukiza. So please make time, visit, and check your health, know your NCD status, and uh, live a healthy and lead a healthy life. Without further ado, Naomba Sasa Twende Wote into these respective breakout sessions. Respective chairs, please observe time. It's one hour. And as soon as you convene, just start. Asante sana, let's all move. 
WHO will remain in sight to discuss overcoming performance challenges in PHC services delivery. Karibu Nisan. So we are starting one minute. Do you have the copy? Let's continue. Okay. So we start. We took our time. Now we want to start doing this. So what do we do? We have no choice. Do we have any choice? I mean, many people are going out and like, so let, let us, let us. Thank you, Steve. So, good morning, everyone. Thank you for attending this session on overcoming performance challenges in PHC service delivery. So the session is led by WHO, WHO both country office and uh, regional office. So in this session, we are going to discuss the functionality of district health system in the African region, as well as discuss the effort of Ministry of Health to reduce the human resources gap at PHC level. Also discuss about strengthening, okay, strengthening community health service to expand the delivery of national essential care package and share how the implementation of the accelerated quality improvement plan will improve the quality of care services at PHC. So we have two main panelists or two main presenters. After that, we have also question and answer from the audience. So help me to welcome uh, Mrs. S Soliana Kidane from WHO Regional Office for Africa. She's a public health expert working uh, uh, at the office of the Assistant Regional Director 
with a long experience in health sector development and, re and review health policies, essential healthcare package development, UHC tracking, health workforce regulation, district health system establishment. She has contributed to regional series on repivoting re re the health system in the 21st century, the development of innovative public goals for health intervention scalability. So let, uh, let, me, uh, let us acknowledge the presence of Soliana. So Soliana, welcome. So the next, the next panelist is uh, Dr. Fergio. I think we all know Fergio. Fergio is currently the health system coordinator at WHO country office in Tanzania with almost 26 years of experience in the public health area uh, in many countries. So a lot of experience and, uh, to share with us this morning. So we're going to start with this presentation. I'm, your, I'm privileged to be your moderator this morning. Uh, my name is Serge Bataliak. I'm the coordinator of the WHO African Health Observatory based in the regional office. So we start with our first presentation, which is basically a study that was conducted here in Tanzania, covering all the districts, presenting at the district health functionality. So let me welcome Soliana on the floor to come and present on that. Thank you, Soliana. Good morning, everyone. And thank you so much for, for the introduction. Um, so today we'll be, I'll be presenting a little bit on the district health systems functionality, really looking at the perspective of uh, the region as a whole, and also a little bit of a deep dive in Tanzania, because this was actually done in all the, all the districts um, across the regions. So just to give you a little bit of background and context of where this is coming from, there's been a need to really focus on the districts as the frontline management team that is closest to the implementation level, um, aligned to the re revitalized primary health care approach, which really looks at the continuum of care, making sure we address the needs of all the different age cohorts across the spectrum, but also the public health function. We have also passed a couple of resolutions in the region, uh, for instance, the 69th RC resolution, which really provides emphasis on provision of essential services through strengthened district or local health systems to make sure that we attain universal health coverage. Currently, however, most of the efforts are actually focused globally or nationally. So we have targets for universal health coverage. We track them quite regularly. For instance, um, Tanzania is around 43, 42. In the last couple of years, it's been increasing quite well. We have national health security. We look at the AHR, but again, either globally or at national level. And the same goes for determinants of health. But we need to better understand what actually needs to be done at the implementation level. So in order to really move away from selective PHC, which focuses on specific conditions, to really comprehensive, addressing all the needs of the different age cohorts, we need to better understand what can be done at the implementation level, especially at the district and frontline management. So the population needs have also evolved. You will agree with me that what we want when we go to health facility today and what my great-grandma would have wanted may have been very different. With more information, more knowledge, we also demand a lot more from the health sector. So you can see for the diagram, a, a common image that we use, this has been reconstructed, but this was endorsed by all the member states, all 47 member states in the WHO Afro region, really looking at how our health system inputs come together. You can see in the circle at the bottom, beyond the seven building blocks in making sure where we have the softer skills as well. We call them, for instance, the lubricants. We have, you, will, you will agree with me that relationship and power, belief, the dynamics that we have with each other, the practices, culture and norms actually play quite a pivotal role in our implementation. It's not only investments in, in human resources and medicine, but really also how we conduct business quite, can make a significant impact. So really looking at all of these components, you will agree that across different districts and countries, there's no one way of doing this. There's multiple ways that we can put all these different elements together. 
But at the end of the day, they should be producing effective demand from our population. It should be yielding quality of care. There should be access to everybody that needs the services and to make sure that this is actually delivered during shock events, emergencies, to ensure that it embodies resilience. Ultimately, we want to have health outcomes that lead to universal health coverage, um, health-related SDGs, health security, for attainment of health and on well-being. So when we talk about now functionality, it's really looking at all these dynamics and acknowledging that there's no one right way of mixing and matching these different inputs into our system. Most of us have focused on performance traditionally. For instance, in, in the African region, we support health sector reviews, midterm reviews, interim reviews, policy dialogues, etc. really analyzing on how our systems have been performing. We select a couple of indicators, we look at the outputs, how have you been doing, what can we be doing better, and so on. But we rarely look at how all of this comes together to function. So here in this analog, and this metaphor that we're using, is really looking at the car to say, yes, how may the bus take the participants from point A to B? Is it working well? What can we be doing better to actually make sure we facilitate the movement vis-a-vis on how fast is this car going to go, or how far has it been going, yeah? So the health system's functionality really looks at all these dynamics and appreciates that the health system's inputs can be mixed and matched in different ways, but regardless, is it functioning? Maybe in my district I need a lot more of my human resources, or I need to put a lot more on my leadership styles than I would in District X, because that district is normally functioning quite well. So we need to put pressure differently on the different elements to actually get the impact that we want at the end of the day. So the health system and functionality assessment really looks at this to say how are they put together and what are the low-hanging fruits that you can have to make sure that we reach the desired impact. So the tool is designed in three aspects. What we call the core is in, in the middle, which looks at oversight, management, and service provision capacities. We also look at distribution of the health outcomes, because as we said, we've been tracking universal health coverage, IHR, human uh, health determinants at a national level, but we now want to understand better at subnational units or districts how these, are, these outcomes are and what we can be doing to improve them. So the idea is that the third option is health facility in case countries actually want to assess functionality of a specific facility. This can be a primary care facility or a hospital, a specific designated one. You can really use these tools to, to better understand how it is going. And the rationale behind is that functionality has a very strong correlation with UHC. So it is showing 0 0.78, implying that it's a very strong predictor of health uh, attainment. So here, it's, it's a, you can see it's a lot of dots and it may be a little tricky to see from far, but the, the idea is that we will just go on the three components for the health system's functionality, what we are calling the core, oversight, management, and service provision. So in terms of oversight, this is really looking at the ability to affect decisions. What is my decision space within my district? Can I do a lot? How can I make sure that my resources are used optimally to actually deliver? So, when we analyze the information, and there's been many countries that have undertaken this, you can see we have around 18. It's more than 600 districts that have done it across the region, in WHO uh, African region. They are really performing quite well in technical areas than compared to what is on the, on the public areas. By this we mean there's technical accountability. We report to our bosses to say, yes, this is what we should be doing and this is what we have done. But we don't do it as much to the public. So when we think traditionally about public engagement or community empowerment, we, we tick the box by saying, okay, I have invited a community participant into the planning. Therefore, they are empowered. They have been part of the process. But really, we also need to be equally as accountable to them as we are to our technical counterparts. So we need to involve them in the decision making, but also even in the results to say this is what you're doing, what do you think, what are your comments and inputs, so that they don't become passive players, but really actively engage in our health systems. You can see Tanzania is on the last, 
these, the dots are the different regions. We just aggregated them, but the, the data is from all the different districts. There's a very wide distribution. That's the first thing you really can appreciate from the graph. That means some districts actually have very good scores and are deploying these oversight capacities quite well. It is very high in general, but some districts are on the lower part. So that means we have a lot of lessons we can learn across the country from each other and to making sure that we strengthen our weaknesses. When we look at the management capacity, this is really looking at the different S's. So we look at strategies, leadership systems, skills, staff, etc. It's the, making sure that, again, we use these resources to provide um, services that are needed. We can see across all the different countries, again, there's quite a very good focus on strategies. So we want to make sure that there are strategies in place, that we have outlined where we want to go. And this is a very common thing across, again, all the different districts that were assessed. But in terms of leadership style, structure, service delivery systems, we're not doing our best. So that means tomorrow, as a district health management team, there can be some specific inputs I take from this in my country or my specific district that tells me that if I was to improve X, Y, and Z, I can actually see substantive change without necessarily investing so much or demanding a lot of the resources. So you, we will see a little bit later, specifically on, on Tanzania, but the idea is that you can see the, the, the management aspect is actually much lower on the leadership styles, structures that we have in place, and even service delivery platforms. We've been working with different organizations, um, also from, we had representation from about 24 countries, to see how are the different service modalities, service delivery modalities, that can be provided to countries as a menu of options. So there will be some sub specific guidance that comes out from the regional office to say these are the different menus and the mix and matches that you can deploy to make sure you actually have optimal access to service delivery. So the third component looks at health service delivery, health service capacity. By this we mean do we have access, quality of care, demand and resilience. And here this is actually the weakest part for the whole region compared to oversight and management capacities. And understandably, because there's a lot more that we need to be able to invest in providing the necessary services. There's high perceived demand, our population really need the services, but in terms of access, it still remains as a key bottleneck in many of our countries. You can see the distribution and the variation across the different countries. For instance, if I look at DRC, it has very large variations across the country. So that means if I live in District X, which is scoring about 90%, compared to another district that is about 20%, my access to services will be significantly different. And this is an equity issue, because that means depending upon where you reside, access to services will significantly differ. Yeah? And the key issues, the drivers for access issues are really physical, financial, and social cultural. For different countries, it can be higher, one can be higher than the other, but we will look at that for Tanzania in a little bit. So when we put all of this together now, the three components, we see that oversight has been a heavily focus for Tanzania compared to services and management. You can see the breakdown in the map. There's some regions that are doing better than the others, of course. But there's also high perceived demand in general compared to the other aspects of Service, service capacity. Management is high for strategy, staff, and skills, at least from the feedback that we get in from districts, but in terms of the leadership styles, structures, there could be further improvement that is implemented. So what does this mean in terms of our health outcomes? How is it distributed across our regions? When we look at availability, we look at universal health coverage across districts. This is just a summary to give you a very rapid um, highlight on what the status quo is for Tanzania. So when we look at availability of services, you notably see that elderly is significantly lower than the other age cohorts. And this is also a little bit similar to adolescents. So the two age cohorts that seem to be a little bit lower than the others are actually adolescents and elderly. And we'll see a little bit of this in, in the maps later. You have all of this information disaggregated by regions, by districts, but for the sake of time and comprehensive, we have just summarized them here. When we look at coverage, 
and remember all of these indicators or all of these dimensions have been derived from the UAT service coverage index that looks at all of these components. NCDs is much lower than the other, so these are least progressed. So we have been putting a lot of resources and investment in making sure that we have the RMSCH, infectious disease and so on, but non-communicable diseases have been actually left behind. So for us to attain our UHC, we need to see how we can strengthen the system to deliver on the full set of comprehensive services that are needed by the beneficiaries. When we look at financial risk protection, this is very interesting because we, talk, we have been talking about the Insurance Act and what we envision for it to, to actually be doing. These are very different depending upon what kind of services you are seeking from the health facilities. So if you're looking for health promotion services or preventive, they're okay. You don't have to spend so much. But if it is palliative care or operative care or inpatient services, then the financial risk protection is not really covering you as much. So there's out-of-pocket payments that are actually, <clears throat> excuse me, that are actually alluded to these services. So when we talk about universal health coverage, we need to keep reminding ourselves that we don't mean that we have to do one, do good in one service area or one condition or one age cohort, but really, how do we address the issues that are pertaining everybody everywhere? Yeah? So I should not be facing an issue or I should not have to pay if I'm accessing this service vis-a-vis -vis another one because as long as it is from the beneficiary's point of view, they're both absolutely essential for my well-being. So rehabilitative and palliative care are something that as a region we have been neglecting for quite a while. We had done recently a, a scoping of effective health interventions across the region. Um, it's been peer reviewed and published and we found very, very little on, on, on those two public health functions as well. So as a region overall, we've not really been emphasizing a lot on that. But when we talk about PHC, it really means key catering as a primary healthcare approach, catering for the continuum of care, not only prevention, promotion, curative, diagnostic, but really looking at the rehabilitative and palliative for the whole spectrum. So we wanted to just highlight also very quickly in a map because pictures, images can speak loud in terms of availability of services by the different age cohorts. Yeah? You will agree with me that when we age, we also want to be catered for whether you're a young one, whether you're older, you want to make sure that all these essential services actually are available and accessible to you as an individual and your families. So we look at pregnancy and newborn, childhood, adolescent, you can see they're relatively good. Adolescent, there's few districts that could be strengthened a little bit further. The interesting results comes when you look at adulthood and elderly. Elderly, you can see immediately, just with the colors, that there's a lot that we can be doing in this area. So that means if you're residing and you're an elderly, an older person in these cohorts, you will not actually have a lot of the services that you deemed absolutely necessary for you to enjoy your health and well-being. As we advance economically, our life expectancies increase, we are living longer, we really need to think for the future on how we actually cater for everybody. And equally important is also the adolescents. In fact, I think there was a paper written on on all of these, these two age cohorts as the cohorts left behind for universal health coverage. Because again, it's not only in Tanzania, but we see this trend quite well in many countries. So for instance, just to give you an example, we had done the same assessment and analysis in Ghana. They, after learning some of the, some of the issues that they had, again, with the same age cohorts, elderly and uh, adolescent, they decided that they would now be introducing specific departments for elderly in one of the remote districts, which is meant to revolutionize, really, the services that will be provided. They deliberately now included youth-friendly services into making sure that they actually have an increased uptake because they realize they've not, they've not made safe spaces for them to seek this healthcare. And in a matter of few months, not even a year, few months, the uptake of the services was significantly increased. And they had the data and evidence to actually show that it worked quite, quite nicely. So why are we doing all of this? The idea is that as a district health manager, I want to know you are preaching UHC, PHC, this is good in concept, but what should I be doing differently tomorrow that I haven't been doing in the last five years? So I want to see how all of these elements can actually impact my operational planning, what I can do better, and how I can have the low-hanging fruits without necessarily going the, the extra mile in, in, in terms of the resources needed. 
So we, we also have a PHC approach that was assessed and looking at the different facility types, so hospitals and primary care units. We look at alignment of stakeholders to the national priorities, empowerment of individuals and communities, financing, human resource for health, and technology. So you can see for the first two, in terms of alignment of stakeholders to national priorities and empowerment, Tanzania has really good scores. The districts are performing quite well. But you can see the difference between the hospitals and primary care units. And this is actually quite interesting. Because what we notice is that primary health care as an approach seems to be conceptualized only relevant for primary care units, those services. But really, as an approach, it should be deployed throughout our health systems, throughout the different levels of care. Because equally, even when you're going at hospitals, you need to make sure those strategies are aligned to our national priorities. We need to make sure the continuum of care is provided in the hospitals as well as primary care facilities. So the idea is that we need to make sure that the approach is embodied in everything that we do and not necessarily only in the primary care facilities that, have, that we have. You can also see it's a little bit lower for technology transfer as well as human resources for health, but of course those variations can be explained further, I think, in the subsequent um, slides. When we look at health security, which is the third component for the health outcomes, we look at detection, organization, and leadership. We look at prevention of the health threats, and then response. Again, it's very interesting to see that the primary care units, even the variation in Tanzania is quite low, and they are scoring relatively better than hospitals. So we can drill down to the information and say, okay, which attributes or which elements are we not really deploying at hospital level? But the idea is that there needs to be emphasis put in terms of all these different effective interventions, not only our primary care facilities, but also at higher levels to make sure that we are ready for the next emergencies and threats that may come our way. So what is the way forward? Really, the information generated is to make sure that at different levels, it can serve for different actions. At subnational units, by that we mean at districts. I think by the previous panel was discussing how data and analysis is really used at the implementation level. Those that are getting the, the assessment, those that are being assessed, actually have to have the information readily so that they can act upon it in real time. So what we have done is with this tool and process, we make sure that when they do the assessment, there's rapid and real-time analysis and display in terms of dashboards and data so that you can see for your district where you are performing, what is happening. You can interrogate the data and actually act upon it. It also makes them feel very involved because they're not just participants, but they're active players in the decision-making. At national level, we get an understanding of some of the issues that might require policy decisions. For instance, we found that in some of the countries that when you are exercising in certain districts for services, you have free access, they don't need to pay, but when you're in a different district, there's out-of-pocket expenditures. So that means there might need to be a policy that is passed to make sure that everybody is catered for and there's no issue in terms of geographical location and you're not disadvantaged because you live in one district over the other. At regional level, in terms of the African region, we're also using this information to really feed into our priorities. To say the districts, the frontline implementers, this is what they are telling us are the issues, and therefore this is where we should put our focus and emphasis. Partners and programs can also use this information to invest. We have seen in a couple of uh, countries that have actually used this analysis and information to really generate resources and to help them implement on the recommendations that are coming about. We've used some of these examples for, just wanted to show you from the regional perspective. We are using them to inform repivoting of the health systems and making sure how we conduct business on the wider scale. So we have, these are hyperlinked and I hope the presentations will be shared so you can explore in your time. Looking at the investments for effective functionality, really documenting on what are the effective interventions uh, across the region that have been documented. We have high impact health service interventions, looking at the change management, if we are going to move from A to B, what are the different reforms that have been taking place in our region, how have they done it, what are the enablers, etc., and really looking at the alignment of the financing as well. Thank you. Thank you, Soliana. So, uh, just to recall that the study was uh, conducted by 
WHO regional office, uh, both country office and regional office together with the Ministry of Health. So all the data presented either for Tanzania and the other countries, we had the support of Ministry of Health. And uh, as uh, one of my colleagues usually says, data speaks more than opinions. So now or, or evidence speaks than opinions, and we really need that for performance. So let's move to the next presentation, since we don't have much time. Uh, the presentation will cover uh, how we can strengthen community health service to expand the delivery of national health essential care package, and also share about the quality improvement plan. So I'll hand over to Dr. Galbert Fojo, who is the WHO Health System Coordinator at the country office here in Tanzania. Over to you, Galbert. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. What? Just give me one minute. I prefer using my, my own computer. <laughs> I hope that it will work. Eh? OK, it's working. OK, why this presentation? You remember uh, during her presentation, proved the functionality of our district on a daily basis. And one of the approach could be, let us really focus on what is, uh, now that we are updating our essential package, what are the best delivery strategy and how will the functionality of our district support the expansion of the national essential healthcare package, including the, uh, the quality of care at district level. And it, it, it's also the best way to translate into actions all the good initiatives that are taken at national, at national level. And to start with the context, we know that, uh, I mean, the, the first element is the epidemiologic transitions. We have been presenting all these successes about the reduction of infectious diseases, the reduction of maternal mortality in Tanzania, the reduction of child mortality. These are great improvements, but we, we are also paying the tribute of becoming a middle-income country with the increase of, uh, I mean, changing our habits, urbanization, and, uh, 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 and uh, with the increase of communicable diseases. If with the increase of the, uh, the, the expectancy life also, we are having, again, more communicable diseases. And there is one aspect that is usually not underscored enough, which is the mental health, which also go with the urbanization. One of the good examples I used to take is how we, we are organizing the morning in our families. There were ways of organizing the morning in Africa with really, I mean, with a, 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 a very organized processes. Nowadays, someone die, we put in the mortuary, then one month later, we come, we go to the, uh, to the cemetery, everybody is gone. If it is the husband, nobody cares about the wife. And we, are, we do not really think about the mental health Another example I'm taking is you don't see a lot of psychologists supporting the kids in our schools. With all the access they are now having to social media, to, in, to, I mean, to, to information that are not under our, uh, under our control. So all these changes have to be taken into account together with the change in healthcare delivery models. What, what, uh, what are these changes in the healthcare de de delivery model? The referral system with the EMAMA strategy, which is one of the success, I think, in this country, you can really see the involvement of the community in the referral system, the change in the trends of the referral system, and we have to adapt ourselves to that. With the community health program, which is a very big program, with a lot of investment from the Ministry of Health, how do we really take advantage of this community health program to improve the health of our community, and not only the curative part, as, uh, 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 as uh, 
we, 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 we were uh, saying already since yesterday. Home-based care, we are, I mean, we will increasingly go to home-based care in our country. How do we take advantage of these, all the reforms that are on, ongoing in the Ministry of Health to make sure we are regulating that practice and the use of uh, technologies, including uh, telemedicine? And one, another element of the context is the limited absorption capacity of the public sector. And if I start with the, the student enrollment in the training institutions, when we were conducting last year the, the, the National Health Workforce account, from only 15 institutions, there were more than 17,000 17, candidates admitted last year only. Those training institutions are actually are almost 300 percent of their capacities. It means the families want the kids to go to the uh, uh, to, to the medical schools or nursing schools and and, uh, and other health-related training schools. But at the same time, due to limited resource availability, the recruitments are decreasing. The absorption capacity cannot be extended every year. And as you can see on this graph, before 2015, almost all the graduated were recruited by the, uh, by the government. But actually, I think from, a, from uh, the data of the Minister of Health, only 40% were, were recruited since 2015. And the 15 uh, uh, training schools I was talking about, when we collected the data, only 31% were actually absorbed by the formal sector, which means we are having increased number of qualified health workers who are either underemployed in, uh, in our big cities or who are exiting to, to other sectors, becoming taxi drivers sometime, or doing some, uh, something that has nothing to do with health. At the same time, there are a lot of unfilled positions in the public sector. And these unfilled positions are mostly in the primary health care services. Dispensary, health centers, district hospital, that's where the gap is the most important. How do we, okay, again, with the context before I, I, I come to how do we use the, uh, the actual reforms, we, we are, uh, the, the Universal Health Insurance Bill was passed in November, and in that context, we know that there are changes that are coming. People will become more aware of their entitlements because you know when somebody pay before the service, he will try to know exactly what he is entitled to. And they will, they, they, uh, I mean, they will enjoy improved access to private sector. If you look at the, the actual data of the National Health Insurance, you can realize that the, the, the private health facilities that are only 30% are receiving 60% of the, the funds of the National Health Insurance, which means if people go to the public sector and they do not get the service they want, they will go to the private sector, and if this is not very well regulated, it will end up jeopardizing our uh, universal health insurance scheme. Moreover, they will have no reason to seek curative services from non-qualified health workers. Uh, this is not politically correct, because at the same time we are, we are promoting the community health uh, systems. But although we, are pro we have to, to anticipate, although we are promoting the community health system, it, we know that when someone will pay for the insurance, he will not understand if you tell him go to a, 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 a community health workers to get the services, why his neighbor who is a qualified clinical officer, a qualified nurse, do not have a job. So uh, another aspect is the expansion of social media. And this is something that we are underscoring. During the COVID-19, I think even WHO was really, I mean, 
was taken by surprise by what happened. Before you communicate what you think it is the right information, the social media have already spray their own version of the information, and most of the health services are not prepared for that. You will have increased information of, on, on citizen rights. We are whistling it already. Something is shared on, on, on WhatsApp, and all the WhatsApp group have it in one hour in the, in, in, in the country. I'm not even talking about TikTok or, or Instagram. And with this improved access to, 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 the, to, to, the, to the information, I'm pretty sure, like it happened with the mobile uh, money and whatever, in three or four years in Africa, you will have a lot of content about health promotion, about health prevention in the social media. If you are not prepared to that, those contents can even be against what we want to promote within the health sector. Another aspect is the reputation of the health sector itself, because the reporting of adverse events, if we do not try to improve the reporting of adverse events ourselves and start working on that, the reporting will be directly through the social media, and it will really jeopardize the reputation of the, of the health facilities. You also have the increased demand for accountability of, on, on quality of services. As you saw in the presentation of, uh, of Soliana, one of the lowest score, uh, in, uh, uh, it was uh, Oversyke, I think, uh, on the Oversyke, was, uh, 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 was the, 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 the social accountability. We need to really work on that, uh, on, on that aspect. And there are policy windows. Uh, since there were two presentations match, I will take more time. Uh, the, the, the first policy window is the community health programs, uh, the political health program we are, we, we are launching. And you know, the minister have already uh, la launched the training of community health workers to, uh, to deliver a, 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 a huge packet of health promotion and uh, health prevention, an integrated package now, and not only for few diseases, but we need improved regulation of, this, of the community health workers' practice also to make sure they are really delivering what they are supposed to deliver. I, I, I saw an evaluation of the community health workers' program that was done in Tanzania in uh, 1988, and one of the complaints was that the community health workers were retaining the patients at community level instead of referring them to the health facilities. And these are the things that must be avoided with the new community health programs. This said, this is really the time to, I mean, to advocate for more resource mobilization within the donor community, the government, and even, the, uh, I mean, central and local government to really implement the community health uh, programs that were designed by the Minister of Health, expecting that this will raise the awareness of, of the community on the entertainment, they will have better knowledge of what is included in the National Essential Package, what are the benefits, uh, 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 I mean, what benefit they can expect from the health insurance, and, and what, what are the material that they can use to promote health in the community. This, but I, I was mentioning the, 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 the improved leadership, because we also need to train community representatives in the health facility board so, so that they can really contribute to improve performance of our dispensaries and health center. But the community health program all, is also give another opportunity now to align our training programs to what people really need in the country. And one of the, the things that we could start thinking about could be to advocate for the funding of integrated home-based care and community health care package. You know, we, we have the direct facility financing resources, and we have the health insurance that is coming. And we know that investing in home-based care, investing in community services, will be much more cheaper than only investing in hospitals. How do we start thinking about it right now? instead of waiting for the program to be launched, and then we realize that we are spending a lot of money in hospitals. 
that this is the time for our universities to think about introducing new curricula. You remember my data on the absorption of health workers. Why don't we have a, 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 a curriculum, in, a certificate in community services whereby nurses, midwives can learn how to deliver an, an, an integrated package in the community? The training will be shorter than the actual training of community health workers, and they will really deliver a lot in the community. How do we organize the purchasing mechanism of those services and make sure the insurance can purchase those services? These are important things to, to, to start thinking about, either by the, the, the academicians and the Minister of Health Top Management. By doing this, we can foster the implementation of the Accelerated Plan for Quality Improvement that was developed by the Ministry of Health la uh, last year and really deliver an integrated uh, package of home-based and community-based care that, that, that is providing either promotional, preventive, curative, and rehabilitative services uh, at home and in the communities. The second thing is improving the self-employment of community health workers. If we don't anticipate, other will do it. I, I, I've received someone in my office who was la already launching something like this in Dar es Salaam. He, and I, I, a mobile app whereby you can easily contact a nurse who will deliver the service to you. I asked him, but are you sure you are aligned with the law of the, of the country? He could not give me any answer. But if we, if we do not anticipate on the regulation. People will start doing, as usually. It's really important to avoid this. And to avoid this, let us try to see how we can really promote these community health services, not only for the community health workers, but also the com uh, uh, improve the capacity of community managers, communica uh, communication officers, etc., who will emphasize on health promotion messages and prevention messages. And for the home-based care, really, it's this the time to see more than the, 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 the curative service only and the disease control only. Speech language patho uh, pathologists, physical therapists, nutritionists, because that's where you can act if you want to preve prevent the non-communicable diseases. Midwives, I, I, I was looking at the data in Zanzibar, for instance, you have almost 90% of uh, ANC uh, coverage, but only 65% of deliveries. From my experience, it doesn't mean that women are not delivering with qualified health workers. Sometimes they are delivering with a qualified health worker in the community, just that they want their privacy. Why don't we just say, okay, let's train our midwives and they can deliver at home because, by the way, the most important is to detect the danger signs and refer the, 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 the pregnant women to the right level of services. And this certificate, should, we should not just think about taking people from their workplace to, to Dar es Salaam or to, or to Arusha for the trainings. Let's think about the world study programs for the community health services. Thinking about joint program between uh, different universities instead of having separate programs. Thinking about introducing entrepreneurship and innovation support for these people who will be self-employed and who will be in the community. How do we encourage an entrepreneurial mindset? How do we provide support to these start startup incubators that will now be regulated instead of leaving them and they do the, the, the things as they, only as they think or only as they want. We also have career counseling and, 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 and mentorship that should be emphasized in our system and not only what we call supervision and we go to the health facility, we tick the box and we do not really provide additional skills to the staff who are feeding the, the, themselves uh, 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 abandon uh, at uh, at grassroots level. Lastly, the the other op window window of op opportunity is the implementation of the accelerated plan for quality of care that was de developed by the Minister of Health. And th this is about really 
working on the quality improvement at all levels of the health system, starting by the planning and allocation of resources at central level, the improved oversight of quality improvement at central level, the improved allocation of resources by PORAL that focus really on what do we want as human resource, infrastructural equipment, medicines, uh, technologies, health information system, how do we organize this to, to focus on quality improvement in the country? Capacity building, definition of innovative model of cares, uh, uh, improvement of the use of guidelines and, uh, uh, and, and, uh, uh, and, and, and uh, coordination of inspections and control. How do we leverage on all of this to make sure people are accessing to people-centered care, to evidence-based care, to safe care, and to customer care? I know that this is really the baby of the chief medical officer. She wants the customer care, but Customer care alone will not be enough if at the same time we do not have the other dimension of, uh, dimensions of quality, of quality of care. Uh, one of the ways of achieving this is really up, upgrading the, the actual star system into a, a full accreditation uh, 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 system that will have the licensing, the accreditation, and eventually the certification for some specific services to make sure we are addressing either the, the, the basic standards to provide the care, the, I mean, the organization of the care itself in the health facilities to, make, to ensure that when the insurance is paying for the outcomes, they are, paying, they are actually paying for quality of services. Uh, uh, Sante San, I think I will, I will not go, uh, go to this slide because the time is over. Thank you very much. So thank you, very insightful presentations. I think some key takeaway, functionality, the ability of deliver the service, and is a, is a, is a, is a strong predictor of, of performance. Uh, consider the age cohort, also the quality improvement. So also PHC, not just at PHC at care level, but PHC as an approach. So I will open, open the floor for question and answer from the audience, please feel free to just raise your hand and uh, we give you the mic. I, I know we don't have much time, but please. Yes. Okay, thank you, Edwin. So, any, just raise your hand and you have the mic to ask your questions. This is a bit better. Thank you very much for both for really two wonderful uh, presentations. You, uh, I just take one small point in fact. You alluded both to one gap we have to address the, the issue of our aging and our urbanized uh, move in the country. And to cover for this aging population, we all know now, we have discussed it a little bit, but we don't see that yet in practice, is geriatrics provision of services by mid-level caters. But I didn't see the word geriatrics in both of your presentations, and I was wondering, because we don't have a geriatrician in Tanzania as yet, at the, from a medical degree level or above, and we don't have it as yet from a nursing perspective. So there is high time in order to address exactly the issues you so very rightly pinpoint in your presentations, to come up with a geriatric cater who can take all the issues of aging people in a comprehensive interlinked way instead of the vertical assessment of the individual problems. I was hoping, and I would like to have your views on that, how we can promote that a little bit more 
and be reflected in your talks and presentations. Thank you. Uh, yes. My name is Dr. Mtei. I have been very much impressed by your presentations. Thank you very much. Uh, about the star rating for accreditation, that is very important. Would the star rating not be good if we went up to the community level and as well not only end at accreditation but also subsequently financing? You don't have to receive the same amount of money if you are star zero. As, uh, our staff as, 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 as of star four, even if you are operating at the same level. Now, another question is, how come that we are not talking on the same level after almost 10 years, even at decision level making, about the number of WHO building blocks? Are they seven or six? <laughs> Thank you. Another question? Yes. Yeah, thank you very much for your nice presentations. Um, my question is not um, so much different to the one that was asked uh, by the first, um, the one who asked that first. But uh, I understand there is no specialized care for the elder in Tanzania, the geriatrics. But um, I wanted to understand more um, when you said there was law, I mean, the availability of services for the elder is law in, in Tanzania. Did it mean um, the issue of access to care or there is no any service that um, is being provided to them. Uh, because I understand for the uh, non-specialized care, uh, most of the facilities are providing. So just a little bit more whether it is about the elder not being able to attend to the facilities access or the issue of service itself. Thank you. Yes, please. Um, thank you for a very excellent presentation. Um, I'm, I was impressed by your slide that it showed family medicine is uh, one of the proposed components to improve primary care. We know WHO and UNICEF have put out strategies and policies to really roll out primary care, I mean uh, family medicine in primary care. But in the presentation, family medicine is not uh, given prominence. We've given more prominence to community healthcare workers. So my question is, what is the role for the WHO in advising and enabling establishment of family medicine in the public sector in Tanzania? Okay, so I think, any last question? Okay, please. I, I was a junior medical officer, I was through the district and told to begin managing some of the systems that I'd never heard about. The, the foundation of PHC is at the district and the community. And uh, from what you presented, there are gaps around leadership and governance, which are very critical in aligning the human resource, the resources around the finance, the medicines, in seeing some of those facilities operate and be sustainable. What aspects of this area are being supported to ensure that some of these young managers are being trained to do that provision? Because mainly their training is about service delivery. And that's why you see the 88% performance in services and then below in terms of the governance. And then my last comment is about it's a consensus is very fundamental. And the challenge that is very outlined, the studies even in Tanzania, in Malawi, and in the public service. How do you transform them from being volunteers 
to giving them the full ownership of the service they provide, instead of being seen as being used by the system, they effectively support. And uh, I, I saw there is quite a huge number of community health workers that will be trained and supported in the country. So what is that budget projection to be supported and for how long? Because if they can't be sustained, then they'll have a high you know, attrition rate and which causes more problems. Thank you very much. Okay, I think we are good for the question. So just to summarize, I'm sure Fujo and Suliana will We'll give the good response. One question on geriatric services, another one on star rating accreditation, WHO bulldog block six versus seven. So family medicine, leadership and governance for district medical officer, and the sustainability quality of care for community health worker. Please over to you, Fredo and Suliana. Okay, Suliana. Uh, thank you so much for the questions and reflections. Uh, really, it's very interesting and very happy to deliver it. So I will start with the first one in terms of the aging population. Uh, you are absolutely right. We did not mention the word just because we were doing the analysis by the age cohorts. But yes, that is one of the critical implications. Do you have the specialties, the geriatric care in our different health facilities? Are they accessible? Are they available? Um, that is the critical question that will be imposed then upon the districts, but also nationally. I think what we notice is that across this analysis from the region, it has implications sometimes just for the district level. It might just be that you have not, even though you have the geriatric care or you have the specialized health worker, you might not have provided the services for those age cohorts or you're not catered for it or they're not positioned in the best way possible to reach this age cohort. But in many instances, we actually don't have those specialized um, human resources. And therefore, we need to see how they inform the policy production, the deployment, the retention, etc., the full cycle. So depending upon where we are as a country or as a district, really we can make informed decision on, on the way forward. But it is absolutely a critical area that I think as WHO we are advocating for to say, let us, it's good that we have been, I think in this discussion I've noticed we were talking a lot on the maternal health, neonatal, which is well and good, but we also have to really be mindful when we are saying universal health coverage and we are moving away from MDGs to SDGs, we have to cater for everybody. So that means really putting our resources yeah. where, where we are saying we are going to achieve this universal coverage for everybody. So um, I think one of the questions also was related to that in terms of availability of access. You were surprised if it is availability or access in terms of the aging population. It's actually looking at both, but really more on the availability of the services. Are they providing specific tailored interventions to these age cohorts? Because all of us have different needs, or you might find me better. That's why we have like school outreach programs, because you want to reach those kids while they are at school. Or you have uh, outreach programs that are, uh, I have seen a lot of motorbikes. Uh, you will go to the field to make sure that you deliver the services, etc. So as an age cohort, are you really catering for me? Maybe I can't even walk to the health facility, so that will be an issue of access. But even to begin with, if I come, are there those available services that are actually tailored to me as an individual or as an age cohort vis-a-vis -vis just having that service overall? So really, there's a lot of information in terms of availability, but it's really looking at do we have those services needed for this age cohort? And most of the time, it's not. It is not there. Um, the, the building blocks is a good question. We, we have the seven traditionally, but we're moving to 13. And that is why I spent a little bit of time highlighting the lubricants, if you saw, <laughs> if you saw in, in my diagram, and saying that we are really appreciating there's building blocks that actually constitute the, the fuel or the lubricants in our system. Because you, you and I both agree that if I work very well with you, things will move. Our power dynamics, how our values uh, are in that specific context we are working together, the relationships we may have, etc. These are soft skills that we undermine, but they make or break our outputs as a unit or as a team. So we are really trying to put a little bit of emphasis on that to say, really, we have to cater beyond these 
hard investments that we've been putting on the ground to say, let's make sure we equip our managers, let's make sure we equip our health workers to do that the best they can and to make sure and we, that they're actually deploying the soft and harder skills or resources at their disposal. So it's a little bit further, but we, we have published a couple of papers and that, that, that resolution that was also passed is by the RC, all 47 members have stated, but there's still a lot of advocacy and relationship that needs to be built to really internalize this and to say, what does that really mean on the ground? I, 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 before maybe passing it on, I wanted to speak a little bit on some of the work we are doing at the region. Um, for the, you had mentioned a question on family medicine, I'm sure Dr. Fedjo will highlight further, but we, under the auspices of future health and economic resilience, we've been working with Harvard University and beyond. We have done different consultations. There's been a lot of repivoting of health systems to say, how should primary care units function as a unit? I think a lot of the discussion, we have talked about primary health care as a level, but really not as an approach. We, we tend to sidetrack a little bit from that. We had a regional conference with all 47 countries just last year, all 47 countries, and that was one of the biggest debates because people were heavily investing and discussing on the primary care as a unit, as a level of care, but not as an approach that needs to be deployed across all of our health systems. Yeah? So that was one of the fundamental changes that we are really trying to unpack and there will be a couple of guiding documents and normatives that come out quite strongly from this, including district management teams, how, how should they conceptualize this, what should be done on the ground, etc. So I think let me hand over, those were the specific ones to me. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Soliana. Uh, really, uh, thanks for your comment. Mo most of the comments that uh, were, were made by participants are really relevant. Just that, uh, I mean, we, 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 we had to, to make choices. Eh? Due to the limited time, we could not just go through all the, all the concepts. And uh, also, yesterday there was another session on, uh, on, on, on the update of National Essential Healthcare Intervention Package that was presented uh, by our colleagues from Ifakara Institute. And uh, one, the, one of the innovation is that the Minister of Health is now trying to update the package and classify the interventions not only by disease group, but by age group. And the elders will be taken into account. And when we say elders are taken into account, it means when we will be defining the delivery strategy, we will see what are the services that can be provided by community health workers, by uh, 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 other health workers at home, in the dispensary, up to the level of the specialist. Because, I, I mean, as I said, you, we have to balance between the, 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 the availability of services and the efficiency of the system as a whole. Where do we really need a geriatrician? And what can be done under supervision? What can be done as outreaches, et cetera? That's a work that the Minister of Health is actually, is actually doing. And I hope that in another... Uh, 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 in another uh, co conference, they will be very happy to, to present what they are doing and, and, and really to involve all the stakeholders in the implementation. The second uh, 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 question that, uh, was about the, the linking accreditation to, to financing. I mean, that's very clear, and we were discussing also this aspect yesterday. Uh, systematizing the licensing, the accreditation, and the output-based payment is really the first step because the, the, the actual uh, star system do not, I mean, do not really say, okay, this is the licensing. If you don't have this one, you can function as, as a facility. And for, we cannot close a public facility, no. But I think the health insurance have the opportunity now to tell the health, facili to tell the health facilities, either public or private, these are the minimum that you should have to be eligible for reimbursement. I hope that in the regulations that the Ministry of Health is preparing, we will have those aspects. And when you can open, then we go to the regular assessment. And again, if you have very low score, it means the, the government is giving you the money for nothing. Because buying poor quality is buying nothing. 
that, that, uh, 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 we really hope that that aspect will be taken into account. I, in, in one of the projects we're implementing in Uganda, we, we even went further to attach part of the or uh, uh, part, part of the government budget to the to the accreditation score. That that means if it was in Tanzania, it would be attached to the star system. But you have to be wise because someone may have a very low star score because he do not have the inputs, and you will penalize him. Him before you do that, make sure that they have the necessary infrastructure and equipment and what they are not doing is effectively their responsibility. But that's, it's definitely the way to go. And even when we'll be purchasing the services, and I think the National Health Insurance is already having that challenge, if you do not link this, uh, the, the quantity to the quality, you will end up purchasing services that either were not delivered or that were, del uh, I mean, that were not relevant for the, for the patient. And your health insurance May, may, uh, uh, we will end up spending a lot of money for nothing. So all, uh, I, I think the Minister of Health is really having the reflection on that, and I, I hope this reflection is done with the, 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 the other stakeholders who are intervening in the health insurance. I will not come back to WHO building block, and so let I know that uh, uh, I, my, mine is always to ask myself, what does all this concept mean to a district officer? <laughs> what does all this concept mean to, some, to a health center in charge or to a district hospital in charge? Because sometimes, I mean, myself, I remember my first planning. The day my boss asked me to do a plan, I did not even know what is a work plan. In the medical school, nobody was teaching all those things. And when we are asking those, uh, that to the health center manager, I mean, we just take for granted that they will do as we want. So uh, uh, it's important that when do we have those concepts, we effectively translate those concepts in things that make sense for people who are working on the ground. Once again, for the family medicine, really, you, uh, uh, our colleague was intervening, for, you are very right. And normally, one of my, my slides was on family medicine. I did not present that slide, but this is one of the ways to go. If you really want, especially in urban setting and suburban setting, we need family medicine. If you want to provide an integrated package of health promotion, prevention, curative, and rehabilitation, we need family medicine. And there is no discussion uh, about that. And lastly, about, uh, about the volunteers, you know, the, the, if you go into the plan that was developed by the Minister of Health, the plan was really very comprehensive. But once again, though the plan is comprehensive, when you come to the implementation, there are challenges. Because if we start paying, one of the best ways of bringing sustainability is having a salary for our community health workers. But if you give them the minimum wage bill, that will increase the wage bill of the Minister of Health by 13% or by 15%. Okay, at the same time, we, you saw the gap that we have in the, in, in the health facilities. They have to take, at the Minister of Health level, they have to take balanced decisions. Uh, to which extent, I mean, do, do they, what are the investments that will be made into the community health system without jeopardizing the, uh, the, the service delivery in health facilities? How can we use all these guys who are trained, all these qualified health workers who are trained, who are not formally employed, and who can deliver some of the things that we want at community level? How do we leverage on that? I think if there's one question that should be a takeaway for us in this room, I will suggest that one. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Fergio. Thank you, Soliana. Uh, just to conclude on, on, the, on this forum on overcoming performance challenges in PHC service delivery, just get in mind three things. Keep the equity in mind, the quality, 
and also the resilience. Thank you. I hope you gain a lot on this discussion, and we hope to see you next. Thank you. session will be on M Mama, the evolution, the vision to reality. Please don't go away. We have a couple of minutes to begin our session. <laughs> 